performing this afternoon. Um, but if you haven't had it uh, any already, I think it's a good as well. Pardon me. No, apparently the audio and folks on Zoom hear me okay. We're good? good? Excellent. Okay, okay. perfect. Um, so I'm going to introduce the speaker in a moment. I just wanted to note that we do have class in here at once, so we'll keep an eye on the time, um, but do expect the onslaught of students to come. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. I am absolutely thrilled to introduce this afternoon uh, Linda Blount. Um, she joined the Black Women's Health Imperative as the President and Chief Executive Officer in February 2014. As president and CEO, she oversees the strategic direction for the imperative and is responsible for moving the organization forward in its mission to achieve health equity as well as reproductive justice for Black women. Uh, prior to joining the imperative, she served as the vice president of programmatic impact for the United Way of Greater Atlanta, where she led the effort to eliminate inequalities in health, income, education, and housing through place and population based. Work. Um, prior to that position, she was the first ever vice president for health disparities at the American Cancer Society. Um, she's also had a successful career, including positions at the Coca-Cola Company, leading strategic business initiatives, and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as an expert scientist. She also has extensive health expertise and has served as consultant for government ministries in Germany, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago uh, as well, where she lived for four years. Uh, she's a Michigan native and she holds a master's in public health uh, in epidemiology from the University of Michigan and a Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering and Operations Research from Eastern Michigan University. So with that, I will hand it over to Linda Blount. Thanks Thank for much. Hey everybody. Hey. <laughs> Glad I got to talk to some of you before. Happy Solar Eclipse Day. So everybody have their, their glasses? Okay, all right. Um, thank you, Dr. Marshall. And and um, Dr. Bowden had invited me, and I know she's not here, but you know, just wanna say publicly, I appreciate the invitation and the meetings I've had and the conversations I've had. And it's great to meet new friends and reconnect with old friends. And there's one in this room I've known for a very long time. Dr. Ron O'Bear, my kids refer to as Uncle Ron. Um, but it's it's good to really good to be here, have a conversation, talk a little bit about you know what we do at the Black Women's Health Imperative. It'll give you some of my editorial, um, and hopefully we'll have some time for for discussion as well. So um, I think the last time I was here was 2017. Dr. Rose in, invited me, and I, I, was that on the undergrad? side I, in, this, in this in this very room okay so been a while um but it's it's, it's, it's great. <laughs> good to be back so um let's jump in um now i've got to advance the slide okay um i work with a mac i don't do this oh good 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 okay so you've all heard the saying that all politics is local. And I think there's another saying that is um, all data are personal. So data released by the National Center for Health Statistics in July of 2021 showed a steep rise in opioid overdose deaths. Jesse didn't know I was going to talk about this. Um, between December 2019, December 2020, um, that was the peak of the pandemic. So more than 93,000 Americans died a 29% increase over the previous year. 6,900 of those people were Black. To, so to be sure, the drug overdose deaths among the Black populations um, and others significantly increased during this time, but I just wanted to look a little deeper. The Pew Research Center reported in an article on substance misuse in early 2022 that the surge in drug overdose deaths has hit Black men particularly hard. And when you read the article, it describes the increase in mortality, provides lots of statistics on incidents of substance misuse and mortality by race and ethnicity, and even speculates on some possible causes like 
um, worsening mental health issues because of the, the pandemic. And then as you continue to read the article, the narrative seamlessly transitions into a discussion on the opioid epidemic, not just drug overdoses, particularly synthetic opioids, as if that were really the subject of the, the article all along, rather than just drug overdose. In the second to the last paragraph, where the authors state that public concern about drug overdose has dropped significantly, it's mentioned that death rates have also sharply increased in recent years for heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine use, and that these increases have been disproportionately, disproportionately felt among racial and ethnic minority groups. So there was nothing in this article that directly tied Black men to synthetic opioid misuse and death. The Department of Health and Human Services declared the opioid crisis a public health emergency on October 26, 2017. So we really should have been looking closely at opioid use data, certainly since then, especially prescription opioids. In an article uh, by Janice Sabin, it was published in January 2020 in AAMC's Viewpoints, she found Half of white medical trainees believe such myths as Black people have thicker skin, less sensitive nerve endings, don't feel pain as much as white people, referred to a 2016 study that was reported in, in the National Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that showed Black Americans are systematically undertreated for pain due to false beliefs about biological differences between Black people and white people. So this is happening during this opioid epidemic. Around this time, an op-ed appeared in the New York Times by Austin Pratt, which described the opioid crisis and the racial bias experienced by Black Americans. The question of data and its interpretation came up. A rare case where racial biases protected African American essentially said that, um, said that due to bias and racism, physicians were not prescribing opioids to Black patients so they were spared the opioid mortality experience of the white populations. He writes, as unlikely as it may seem, these negative stereotypes appear to have shielded many African-Americans from fatal prescription opioid overdoses. This is not a new finding. But for the first time, an analysis has put a number to this issue, projecting that around 14,000 Black Americans would have died had their mortality rates been the same, relate being the same, been the same as those rates related to prescription opioids um, as white white Americans. So as they say, the blowback was swift and Twitter remains undefeated. <laughs> so I'd been on a panel um, with Austin and actually um, Dr. Ja. And he had he reached out to me for my thoughts because he was, as you can imagine, getting a lot of email. Um, and I thought that was pretty unusual that he would even reach out to me. But Austin's, you know, a great guy. He's really committed to understanding health disparities and promoting health equity. And he really wanted to legitimately understand the issue. So a revision was published a few weeks later. And in it, he wrote, outside of research. Routine medical practice continues to treat black and white patients differently. This has been documented in countless ways, including how practitioners view pain. Racial bias in healthcare and overprescription of opioid painkillers accidentally spared some African Americans from the level of mortality from opioid medication, medications observed in white Americans. And then he quoted me, while African-Americans may not have died at similar rates from opioid misuse, we can be sure needless suffering and perhaps even death occurred because provider racism prevented them from receiving appropriate care and pain medication. The fact that we don't count these instances means we will never know how much harm has occurred. So how we collect and use and report data and sometimes how we omit it or even make it up 
can give very misleading impressions of an entire population. It can affect how care is delivered, how programs are delivered, and how policies are enacted. 40 years ago, the Black Women's Health Imperative uh, was founded on Spelman's campus. Anybody from Spelman? Thank you. <laughs> um, where Billy Avery brought 2,000 of her closest friends together to talk about self-care in a time when Black women couldn't necessarily count on getting good care from, from the system, be it the education system, the economic system, the hospital system, the political system. Billy began her activism and her career by creating the Gainesville Women's Health Center in 1974 because she saw Black women dying when they were trying to get abortions in Florida. And so for more than 50 years, she's been fighting for reproductive rights and justice. She's been fighting for Black women's health. And she is still an active co-conspirator today. She is, I talk to her two or three times a week. She's still on the scene and I'm still trying to keep up. So our mission and vision is pretty simple. Um, we really aim to ensure that Black women get the standard of care reliably, and that when we say programs or policies or care are evidence-based, they have reason to believe that they were part of the creation of that evidence and it actually applies to them. And all of our work is really built on a justice framework. So we've got a few strategic priorities. Um, since I've been on board, we have invested over $25 million in community-based organizations to, to do work, to try to get closer to health equity. So we're focused on wellness, chronic disease prevention, obesity-related conditions, uh, maternal health, reproductive justice, HIV. Um, we launched a few years ago the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition. Um, it's about a $20 million coalition of pharmaceutical companies, advocacy groups, policymakers, because what we found out was that black and brown patients and low-income patients experiencing rare disease waited on average seven to nine years longer than white patients to get to a diagnosis and treatment. And all of our work is undergirded by policy. Um, every election cycle, we produce Black Women Vote, a policy agenda, which outlines key issues for the election and why they matter to, to Black women. And then there's this checklist for where candidates um, stand on these issues. We're a 501c3, so we can't advocate for any candidate, but we give this agenda and the checklist to get out the vote folks so they can talk to their folks about where their candidates stand on the issues. So we all bring something to our work. What I bring is a certain, my mother would say attitude and disregard for convention which I've had a very long time. Um, and I also bring a focus on research and data and science and actually getting to the truth, actually solving the problem because I believe we actually do know what, what the issues are and how to solve them. So I'm from a small town, Jackson, Michigan. I think there's one person in the room that's heard of Jackson, Michigan, <laughs> Jesse, who's also from a small town in Michigan. Um, the birthplace of the Republican party home to the largest walled prison in the world. And there are signs, um, Jackson is sort of halfway between Detroit and Chicago along I-94. And if you get 50 miles outside of Jackson on either side, there are signs that say prison area, do not pick up hitchhikers. And they mean it, or at least when I was there. Um, but probably what's been most impactful for my public health career in, in many respects has been the seven years that I spent at a, an organization that's in the carbonated sugar water business. So what I realized at Coke, even though I was not in marketing, um, was that Coke had a product to sell, not beverages. Coke was selling experiences. Their product was your life will be so much better and cooler if you drink Coke. Well, we too in public health have a product to sell. You know, it's health, it's public health. And I frankly think we do a lousy job of selling it. We come to our work and our products from that we're selling from the perspective of it's the right thing to do. 
you should want to be healthy. You should want to eat right. You should want to get physical activity. And we offer research programs and policies that will help you do just that. All you have to do is do it. That seems to be our message. And we do lots of things, community gardens, job training programs, transportation to and from appointments, scholarships, community-based participatory research. And here we are. So I'm not suggesting that the public health profession adopt a market-based approach to improving health outcomes, but for all the time and effort we spend in public health and talking about it and doing research and innovating and disseminating, we clearly need to do something different. So this is a picture of the famous Cascades. Um, and as far as I know, it's the only lighted concrete waterfall with wa with um, fireworks on the planet. And it draws hundreds to thousands every summer to see it. So someone thought this was a great idea and I suppose it was. It was an idea that wasn't replicated or scaled, hasn't been innovated on. And aside from postcards and t-shirts, there's no real outreach. But I'm guessing none of you've been there, never been to the Cascades. Don't know what you can miss, Jesse. Um, but from an entertainment perspective, this is what Jackson, Michigan has to offer. So people go, it's what they know. I know the forces that the Black Women's Health Imperative is working against. I grew up with them. So part of what distinguishes our work from others is how we use language, how we define and interpret terms, and how we connect those terms to the lived experiences of Black women. People do what they value, always. So to move our work forward, like the Cascades, we've had to be unconventional. We've had to understand what's valuable to people whose hands are on the levers of power, whose hands are on the levers of funding, whose hands are on the levers of policy, what's valuable to them and how do we make what we're selling more valuable to them and the impact that they currently get from the status quo. So our product, can be replicated, hopefully, and scaled, and go beyond t-shirts to real change. So when I started at the Black Women's Health Imperative, I, I had to learn about how people were using some pretty common terms. So what these terms mean and how they're used really depends on people's perspectives, their values, their politics, maybe even hope. Um, and these definitions have certainly changed over time. Diversity, when it first came about in the mid 60s, you know, um, came on the heels of civil rights, of voting rights. And it essentially was this thing that white, heterosexual, cisgendered men did to or for people who were not that. So at the end of the day, everybody was aggrieved. Now, we say, we talk about the business case of, of DEI and, and the, the return on investment for DEI. But even if this is the case, you all have heard the new term for DEI, the new definition, didn't earn it. Um, that movement has made it clear that the business case isn't the driver. In 2016, there was a study in the Harvard Business Review that found that five years after DEI training, companies were actually less diverse because there's a backlash to it. In 1985, health disparities became a common term. And disparities are just differences, but people really meant differences that shouldn't exist. And people have always seemed to confuse diversity and disparities. When I was at the Cancer Society, I was in health disparities, but I was always confused with the chief diversity officer who, who was black and male, six to about 250 pounds. So people always got us confused for, for some reason. Um, we were constantly trying to explain to people what we did. Briefly in, in sort of the mid late eighties, we talked about health equality, but then that was thrown out because what people heard was, oh, you wanna make the health outcomes of the white population worse to be closer to the black population. So we, we stopped using that term. 
And I just want to mention a couple of others. Um, intersectionality, Kim Crenshaw coined this term in the late 80s, where we were talking about health, reproductive health in particular. And she said, but that can't happen outside of a justice framework. You can't, we can't just advocate for rights because of black women don't even have those rights. Then we've got to we've got to consider what it means to be a black woman um, in a political society. So it is that intersection of race and gender and politics, politics and economics. So she talked about intersectionality, which we continue to use in our work. And a few years after that. And in a meeting in Chicago, reproductive rights groups, Billy Avery and Loretta Ross and some other friends were there and said, really, this is reproductive justice. That's what's really at stake here. And then, of course, there's the social determinants of health, which we're all familiar with. It appeared in the literature in the UK in the early 80s and not in the US literature until much later, late 90s, early 2000s. And of course, we were going to address all of this and fix all the ills of the issues of equity through cultural competency training. And so what do these terms really mean for racial equity? Generation Z is the last generation that will be majority white across the globe. So I wonder how health equity will be viewed and defined 20 to 30 years from now. And how will we know when we've been successful? So I've been called these terms. I've been called diverse. Well, who's diverse? I've been called a minority. Who's a minority? A minority is a math term. How can a person be a minority? But that's where we are now. And so the language clearly is going to have to change to keep up with the changing demographics. It's safe to say, I think, that we're not going to DEI our way out of this issue. We're not going to train or pipeline or awareness build or program our way to health equity. Clearly, we've got to do something different. So I'd like to quote my dear friend, Siobhan Arline Bradley, who's president of the National Council of Negro Women. Reverend Bradley says, we can look at people through the lens of the problem, or we can look at the problem through the lens of people. In this work of health equity, we tend to problematize people, and they're not the problem. I sat on a panel in, in, at APHA in 2016, and Julie Palmer was there. She's the PI of Boston University's Black Women's Health Study. And she was talking about their work and the 172 papers at the time they'd been written in health disparities and you know, painting a fairly gloomy picture. I said, Julie, is it, is it all bad? I mean, this is terrible. And she said, well, in fact, in the Black Women's Health Study, the majority of the women, some 59,000 of them in the study, be, reported their health as very good or excellent. So I said, well, why are we writing all these papers about how bad things are if the majority of the women in the study report their health as very good or excellent? She said they did, they just don't use the same terms for health that we do. So we partnered with um, the Black Women's Health Study and created Index Us which is the first ever report on Black women's health based on healthy Black women. And we wanted to look at their health and the barriers that they face through their lived experiences. And then we asked Black women to define health. We surveyed over 3,000 women. To just It was qualitative, just give us words and phrases, whatever health means to you. 85, 80 to 85% of the words Black women use to define health were psychosocial, I'm calm. I'm at peace. About 10 to 15% of the words they use were financial. I can keep a roof over my head. I can take care of my kids. Only about 5% of the words and phrases that Black women use to define health had anything to do with disease state or physical health. So what I heard was Black women were saying, well, if I can get my mind right and my spirit right and my money right, I can take care of everything else. And so Black women don't see themselves as broke or broke down. So we changed all of our work at BWHI, all of our messaging, all of our policy work, every, the way we approached everything changed to look at this issue from an asset perspective, not a deficit perspective. It made sense to look at this work the way Black women look at, look at this work and look at their health. 
So I'm going to talk about a little bit about what we've done, but I just want to ground us in reality. Does anybody in here have an idea of when in the U.S. we were closest to equity in health, economics, education? Any point in what point in time we were closest? I guess. 1972, exactly right. On the heels of civil rights, voting rights, affirmative action, that was that was the point in time. We are actually more segregated now than we were 50 years ago. So many researchers you've read, David Williams, Arlene Geronimus, Kamara Jones, Ron O'Bear, have named these underlying causes. And those who know me, have heard me say this many times, I don't think we need another health disparity study effort in life. Mm -hmm. I think we know what's going on. I think we know what the issues are. And I think I, we know what the solutions are, even if we don't wanna say that part out loud. So everybody's familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, it's, you know, sort of guides how our behavior is dictated by these, these five categories. And it was really in part an explanation for what motivates people and a tool that we could actually use in systems and policies so that we might move to a more civil or equitable society. So he talks about our basic needs, food and water, security and safety, our psychological needs, relationships and connections, feelings of accomplishment. And ultimately, that leads to self-fulfillment, being able to, to achieve um, our full potential. So I think perhaps there might be another explanation for, our, for why our systems perpetuate inequalities. And I think it's a more realistic hierarchy of needs, um, which I call they. So when we look at basic needs, they feel like I have enough, and they don't have more than I do. They are unseen, and I don't have to interact with them except maybe to get my basic needs met. And as we move up to psychological needs, I live and work around people who think like me, look like me, agree with me, and they aren't taking opportunities from me. And ultimately, self-fulfillment comes when I can claim my rightful place in society, what I'm due. It's Indeed, I think an explanation for what motivates people. And it is a tool for developing systems and policies that perpetuate inequalities in our society. And we know, or we should all know, that inequalities are absolutely in the eye of the beholder. So even though I'm an epidemiologist, there won't be a whole lot of data, but I just wanted to show this chart. We're used to hearing the statistic of black women having a 40, 40 to 42 percent higher mortality rate from breast cancers compared to white women. So we go to the way back machine in 1981, 82, both incidents and mortality rates were about the same. And then they began to change. What happened in 1983? We learned to detect breast cancer, we learned to treat it. So this gap, this difference between black women and white women simply reflects who got access and who didn't. There's no biologic or genetic explanation for a 40% gap in mortality rates. So the US Preventive Services Task Force makes recommendations for screening guidelines. And in 2015, I don't expect you all to read that, but they made recommendations to raise the age of screening mammography from 40 to 50. And they also said mammography should be every other year. In 2016, though, I attended 30 meetings and in 29 of them, I was the only black person in the room. So we were trying to advocate to get the PALS Act passed, protect access to life-saving screening, which would have then put a moratorium on raising the age of screening mammography. Um, and so I was in lots of meetings, um, and I was we were really I was really passionate about this because there were kind of two issues. If we raise the age to fifty, then by statute, insurance companies wouldn't cover screening mammography for average risk women under fifty, and and women weren't going to pay for mammography out of their pockets. And another thirteen hundred black women would have died every year. 
So in a lot of these meetings, there were my former ACF colleagues, the USPSPF folks were there, and they said, but Linda, these are all these recommendations are based in science. You know, these are these are studies. And I said, Yep, you're right. And they and they were right. Absolutely, their recommendations are based in in study in science. These studies were done in Sweden and Canada. There were no black women in them. So since we know black women get breast cancer on average five to seven years younger than white women, why would we wait to start looking for breast cancer? So fortunately that the PALS Act passed, a moratorium was declared, and then last a few months ago, the USPF PSTF decided not to raise the age. So the recommendation has stayed at, at age of at 40. But the question I had through this whole process is given what we know, why wasn't that data? enough. Why did we have to go through all of this? So we don't know exactly why Black women get breast cancer younger. Um, in fact, there's a lot we don't know about disease expression in Black women. But there are some things we do know and don't factor into research and programs and policy. So Black women have, on average, 15% more cortisol in our bloodstream as compared to white women. Arlene Geronimus found that Black women actually age faster. She coined the term weathering. So if you have a 69-year-old Black woman and white woman, biologically, the Black woman is literally five to seven years older. Tanae Lewis, who's at Emory, found that the telomeres in Black women were shorter and more frayed. And that led to changes both in metabolic responses and inflammatory markers. She was able to find a causal relationship between experiences of racism and shortened telomeres and obesity-related syndromes, diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. Lita Mass Jackson found a causal relationship between experiences of racism and low birth weight babies. The Black Women's Health Study found a causal relationship between experiences of racism and gender discrimination and uterine fibroid tumors, as well as coronary heart disease. And they found that if you give black women and white women the same high fat diet, black women will gain more weight and gain it faster. And if you give black women and white women the same low fat diet, black women will lose less weight and lose it more slowly. So in the literature, because of the way language is used, we often give people the impression it's because they're black. And many other issues occur because people are black. But that's not the case, of course. But healthcare providers, researchers, policymakers sometimes act accordingly. So race is not a risk factor. It's a social construct, it's a policy, political construct. Racism is a risk factor. Gender discrimination is a risk factor. Income inequality is a risk factor. At the Black Women's Health Imperative, we've done some modeling um, and to you know, just go along with a little magical thinking. If we could tomorrow eliminate racism and gender discrimination, then a few things would happen. The poverty rate would, could be cut by as much as 90%. Those of us who earn wages would see about a 20 to 30% increase in our pay. Corporate earnings could increase 15 to 20%. And the cost for corporate training and recruitment and retention costs would all drop by as much as 25%. Healthcare costs, of course, would drop dramatically. Um, but the fundamental issue to making all of that happen is that power would need to be shared. So how can we really hope to improve the health of a population if we're not acknowledging and working to actually get to and solve the root cause of the problem. A few years ago, um, we, Black Women's Health Imperative, we invited some women to participate in some focus groups um, in the DMV area, DC, Maryland, Virginia. And we had 12 focus groups, each with about eight to 10 Black and Brown women in them. And each had a facilitator to talk about community advocacy and their experiences with PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV. 
during the course of these conversations, the issue of prevention medication came up. The facilitators mentioned that, in fact, there were two drugs on the market that had been shown to be effective at preventing HIV transmission among men who have sex with men. And the, the first response that, that came from these groups almost uniformly was shock. What do you mean <laughs> they're drugs that to prevent HIV? Like, why, why don't we know about them? And then that shock really turned to anger and confusion. At the debriefing session afterwards, um, the fact that we know how to prevent HIV came up again. This time the research sponsor was in the room, the academic partner and the FQHC director was there. And the academic partner noted that no women were part of the study. And the sponsor added that they were giving some women on the continent of Africa these drugs and seeing some things that were, were positive and, and promising, but there hadn't been a study among women. In fact, the F FDA wouldn't allow the manufacturer to actually conduct a study among women. The FQHC director noted that in his clinic, some women were part of a community-based study of PrEP, and they had some interesting data on use and acceptance and that they were taking that data and using, combining with some other clinic data to develop programs for PrEP among black women. And at this point, one of the participants stood up and said, you know, I go to your clinic. So all of you are talking about data. And she said, my data and what have you done with it? How can I possibly advocate for myself, make the best choices for myself if I don't know what's going on. That ended up being a rhetorical question. So as we look at data and funding and advocacy, it's, you know, this is, I think, an interesting example of, of, of sort of all of that. There are 30,000 people living with cystic fibrosis in the U.S., um, and about 100,000 people living with sickle cell disease in the U.S. The total funding for cystic fibrosis is seven times that of sickle cell disease, and at a per person level, the delta is about 27x. Cystic fibrosis advocacy groups are very active. They're on the Hill, pleading for funding. They go to academic meetings and present. They write, they're organized, and they are largely white people living with sickle cell disease are mostly black. And there are sickle cell disease advocacy groups and they, they do advocate, but they have nowhere near the resources of the cystic fibrosis folks. So I want you to know that advocacy is a luxury. It takes time, it takes money, it takes connections to really be able to advocate. And researchers and policymakers and physicians even sometimes get the impression that black and brown people aren't as interested in research or interested in curing diseases because they don't see them advocating in a way that they're, that they're used to. They are interested, but they have jobs. They've got to, they've got to get things done. They don't have that luxury of time and money. So I just wanna make sure that we don't mistake lack of advocacy for apathy because that's not the case. But sometimes advocacy doesn't really work. A few years ago, I collaborated with some folks out of Santa Clara University in Virginia Commonwealth on um, a paper that looked at bias in the algorithms, the machine learning language of an electronic health records scheduling system, a very famous system that almost all hospitals use. Um, and we found that the system actually, the, the machine learning, the algorithms actually were double and triple booking black patients. So naturally, I went to the manufacturer. I went to the CEO, the chief technology officer, the CHRO, the CFO, the CMO. I went to everybody. They look, here's what we found. I mean, what are you guys going to do about this? I am still waiting on a response. Nobody would even respond with, you know, hey, that's that's we're proud of our system. We stand by our system. I got no response from anybody. And of course, our next study is to find out what happens to these patients because they leave. So do, do they then show up 
back at the emergency department with advanced disease, did the, you know, our mortality rates higher? We don't know, but we're going to do that next. But I'm not sure who the developers consulted with when they created this algorithm. Um, I don't know who participated in user acceptance testing. I don't know where they got their data from, who provided it, but it would appear not enough Black people were, and it really does matter. So COVID, COVID taught us that. We saw that pulse oximeters don't work as well, or then didn't work as well on people with dark skin. I was at LaGuardia yesterday, couldn't get the water to come in. And I had to ask the white woman next to me, could you wave your hand there so I can wash my hands? And still we're having these same, these same issues. Um, dexamethasone turned out not to be as effective on Black people with severe, severe disease. In 2014, the state of Hawaii sued Bristol-Myers, Squibb, and Sanofi, um, the manufacturers of Pla Plavix, accusing them of deceptive marketing um, because they didn't disclose that the drug actually wasn't as effective for some patients of East Asian and Pacific Islander descent. One out of five people diagnosed with multiple myeloma in the U.S. is Black, and Black people are more are twice as likely as white Americans to be diagnosed with it. Yet of the 722 participants in the study, only 13 were black. And the percentage of black and brown patients in clinical trials really hasn't changed in 20 or 30 years. You know, it's still 4% or so. So how do we make progress? If what becomes evidence depends on who's asking the question, who they're asking, what questions they're asking, maybe even who's funding the research. You know, how do we actually get to health equity? So I do want to make mention briefly of medical mistrust, because that came up a lot during COVID, but it continues to be uh, in the literature. And all the talk about clinical trials, um, participation and participation in research by black and brown patients or community members, we should note the most cited reason that Black people give, and Black women in particular give, for not participating in research is they're not asked, not that they don't want to, and not that they mistrust the provider community. We surveyed um, 4,000 women and asked them about participating in, in clinical research, and of those who did, 60% of them dropped out, and the single most cited reason they gave for dropping out was that they were treated so shabbily, that they were disrespected that the researchers treated them as though they were doing them a favor by having them in their study. So we've heard this from black and brown women in clinical research, community-based research, even community-driven research. We kind of hear the same thing. So in our work, we were determined to actually solve that problem. Not the people, um, but to do the things that will create observable and measurable change in the lived experiences of black and brown women in systems of care delivery in research and policy, or at least make it clear to those whose hands are on the levers of power or who seem not to understand. So in our work, we have our Change Your Lifestyle, Change Your Life program, which is started out as, started out as diabetes prevention um, it is CDC's top performing program for diabetes prevention. It has now been expanded to chronic disease. CDC likes our model because we got involved with women. We started with what does it mean to be a black woman in this society in this time and organized our program and modified their curriculum accordingly. They then asked us to modify the curriculum for black men, for Hispanics, and now our curriculum is used everywhere and we're a center of training because we started with the person, not with the disease. And it turned out black women actually kind of plateaued and as a way of really helping them be successful, our coaches would take them to fittings and, and fashion consultants because they weren't gonna buy new clothes because they were losing weight. So they learned how to rework their, their own outfits so they could continue. And we've got an 88% um, retention rate Last year, we launched um, Project Health Equity, but it came out of a partnership with the NFL and pa Pastor Sarah, Sarah Jakes Roberts. So our partnership with them reached 
over 200,000 women, 6,000 of whom said we're interested in research. We went on tour with Pastor Roberts, um, where we talked to Black women and people in the audience about the importance of research and medical care and what this means. And then I would, I've been to four NFL drafts to talk to these rookies about philanthropy. You're about to get a whole lot of money. Here's some ways you can help. And then I do separate sessions with their moms who also are about to get a whole lot of money, but have the same issues that we're talking about. If you all are black women, now you have resources to take care of yourselves in a way that you never thought before. And it's been really interesting. So we're gonna start recruiting our first group of women in breast and cervical cancer screening. And the purpose of this research is to finally answer the USPST to say, yes, here's when screening should begin and here's how often it should begin. And because I'm me and have the attitude that I have, we've launched two for-profit subsidiaries. Fair Work is a, a way of looking at fairness in the workplace, not DEI. So we've got an AI tool that will look at 400 metrics and produce an index of fairness that we can tie to employee health, but also corporate metrics and, and cost reduction, top and bottom line revenue. Um, you know, the index will actually give leaders a sense of how fair their organizations are, but importantly, why that matters. And this year we will launch this organization with a terrible name, but Clinical Resource Optimization and Acceleration. But essentially it's, it's doing the work that CROs don't do, doing the, the work rather that researchers don't wanna do or can't do, but We'll, you'll, we'll deal with bias in design. So we'll use a tool that will actually de-risk clinical trial design, research design for bias, and look at the experience of patients of color, low-income patients, and rural patients in clinical research so that they will get a better outcome, but also to inform the researchers so that they can do a better job and stop treating people like they're doing them a favor. So I created these two for-profit businesses really for two main reasons. One, the philanthropic industrial complex can be tough to navigate. And two, I don't wanna to have to depend on the kindness of strangers to keep the doors open. It would be great if I could say to everyone, here's our strategic objectives, fund that. Instead of having funders sometimes tell us what they wanna find. My name is John. I appreciate what we do for this neighborhood. Your pizza is making a difference. Well, thank you, John. You know, when we opened, we were just a small father, a simple mission to rise. Right, listen, I represent a large institution, and we're interested in buying a significant number of their pizza. Well, our cheese pizzas are $10. Right. I've done some number crunching and determined that we're going to need 10 per month, and I can pay $8 for five. Oh, and I'll need them to be Sicilian. Oh, but the Sicilian pies are more expensive. That won't cover my costs. I'm concerned about the impact on quality of that price, and, you know, my reputation is at stake. Of course. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of other pizza places around here. I mean, it's okay. You know what? I've got an oven that's been on the fritz, and maybe the steady business will help pay for repairs. Oh, I love that help with that. Well, 100% of what we give to you must be spent on me. What you want to do is fill out the paperwork, so maybe they get into the stipulated adjustments to the business model, and then after the site visits and several other payment ships are rolling. Here on page 47, okay? Your ship yeah. will either have to been nominated for a James Beard Award. Mm -hmm. I see pizza. The James Beard Award. Huh? Most of my cooks can't even drink beer. He got transferred to a different department. Oh. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. His expectations are a bit uh Reasonable. Oh, we don't make falafel sandwiches. 
Well, that's what we need you. And I also need you to track each and every one of your expenses on this ancient table. Use the button pen. Yeah, the blue ink. Nice to meet you. And um, really, you are making a difference. That's <laughs> that. Listen, I would like to order a large supreme pizza. And someone told me that you had an oven on the press. So here is $100 to go towards facing that. No, 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 so this work is messy. The nonprofit business can be really messy because um, you're essentially begging for money. But I think nonprofits can be the conscience of change. So you all will do everything. You'll conduct research, you'll treat patients, you'll lead nonprofits. Some of you will probably be titans of industry at, at, one, at one point. Um, we definitely need data to tell the story, but we should never tell the story of data. This is data a person. So at Black Women's Health Imperative, we try to use data in a way to make people and help people and see their connection to solutions, um, to progress, to observable and measurable change. At the height of COVID, I had so many people come to me and say, racism, health disparities, oh my, they're related. Who, who knew all of this? So in this work at this time, I really have no illusions about being able to make anybody do anything, but by looking at data, using data and reporting it in a way that actually honors the people who are providing it, I think we can do one thing. I think we can cure ignorance. So thank you. Using data for accountability. Yeah, sounds great. Like a great idea. Um, you know, there are maternal mortality review committees. Not not all states have them. I think maybe 30 states do. So that data have been fed back to hospital systems to say, you know, here are issues, you know, with resources or care delivery. These people didn't get the standard of care. These folks did. And it what you're saying makes sense in a system where people actually really want to do better and are sort of balancing care and dollars and, and other issues. So far, it hasn't been enough of a driver to get major change because there's always an explanation for, you know, every hospital leader you talk to says, well, in this case, it was this, it was that. We It's really not because we're not providing the best care. So we're going to have to come up with a way of accountability differently. I think there should be heatus measures around maternal outcomes, because I believe personally, if providers and healthcare system leaders feel like they're not gonna be reimbursed every time they let a black woman die, they'll figure out how to listen to her because they'd rather have the money. So I don't know that accountability will come from doing the right thing, but it may come from wanting to stay in business. Sounds kind of hardcore, doesn't it? No questions? Well, thank you all very much.